There are a lot of ways that we could dive into this discussion of uh, Eurasia, but I think that we have to talk about geopolitics. Um, and I want to set it up this way. You know, there was a time um, with apologies to um, um, the, the leaders uh, on the stage here when the rest of the world may have considered um, Central Asia to be something of a, of a backwater. Now, that was never true, of course. Um, but the fact of this that whatever people used to think, today nobody, um, not even ignorant Westerners like I, um, like me, are able to think that because the great game is back, uh, and it's come to, um, to Central Asia. Um, the countries represented on this panel, Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia, uh, Kazakhstan, stand at the very heart of this um, contest. To the north of the region, Russia is becoming ever more assertive. To the east, China has suddenly become a huge and very interested player, um, pouring in uh, huge resources and very interested in uh, extractive deals. Um, to the south, Turkey and Iran have become much more assertive both on their own and in cooperation uh, with uh, Russia. The war in Syria and the end game of the campaign against the Islamic State is sending shockwaves <coughs> throughout the entire region. And then there's the West, of course, um, where the EU and the United States remain key players uh, for and in Eurasia, an attractive lure um, to some countries in the region, a frustrating disappointment, I think, to others and an outright threat to still others. Now, the good news for us is that we have four outstanding panelists who are perfectly placed to help us sort through all these questions. So let me quickly introduce them, um, and then I'll ask some questions myself, and then hopefully I can get questions from the audience. Um, seated to my uh, immediate left is um, uh, President Aliyev, uh, President of the Republic of Azerbaijan since 2003. Um, we have to my right, um, uh, Prime Minister Kavir Kashvili of Georgia. Um, to uh, his right is Erbalat Dusayev. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, right. Fine. <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Kazakhstan. And then Jean-Yves Charlier, who is Group CEO of Vion, um, which is one of the world's biggest telecom firms um, with the sixth largest mobile phone network on the planet. And he told me just before we started, 50 million subscribers in the Eurasian region. Um, and if I'm right, you also happen to have an MBA from the Wharton School of Business, um, something that you share with uh, the man who will be speaking here on Friday. Um, well informed. <laughs> so uh, my first question is going to be an obvious one. Um, for the politicians on the panel, and that is, um, as, as relatively small states caught between these powerful giants, um, which I've just mentioned, all of whom want something from you, how do you balance them without provoking them? Uh, many years ago, um, Canada's then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, the father of the current Prime Minister, said about living next to the United States that um, such proximity to a superpower is like sleeping with an elephant. No matter how friendly and even-tempered the beast is, you're affected by every twitch and every grunt. Um, and if you're not careful, they may roll right over you without even noticing. Um, so President Aliyev, let me start with you. Um, tell us, what's your outlook for Eurasia for the year ahead? And how will Azerbaijan navigate this very tense and now quite dangerous neighborhood? Mm. Well, neighborhood, of course, can be a problem and can be an advantage. It depends on your policy and on relations with the neighbors. I think for every country, relations with the neighbors should be a priority, uh, especially in our region. Uh, in Azerbaijan, we do not have uh, internal risks and threats. Therefore, we must also guarantee security on our borders. And the best way is to establish a very pragmatic and very sincere relations with your neighbors based on your national interests and based on the understanding of the national interests of your neighbors. I think that uh, in Azerbaijan we managed to establish such a partnership and with all our neighbors except uh, Armenia, which continues to occupy almost 20% of our territories, Azerbaijan has very good relations. Uh, with the neighbors across the Caspian, with Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, with Georgia, Turkey, Iran, and Russia, and with every country of our neighborhood, we have a very special format of cooperation. Our independence is young, only 26 years. 
of independence, but I think Azerbaijan managed to establish itself as a truly independent country, which can afford to conduct independent foreign policy, policy which is based on our national interests and which is not against uh, interests of our neighbors. So I think uh, for a country which is smaller than most of its uh, neighbors, important is to find this proper balance and to uh, get advantage of the neighborhood because uh, big neighbors means big markets. And for us, uh, the best market is the market of our neighbors. <coughs> Therefore, uh, mutual interests, balance of interests, of course, non-interference into internal affairs of each other, and very pragmatic, practical approach on cooperation in the neighborhood, I think one of the reasons for success of our country, one of the reasons of uh, internal stability, and good prospects for the future. Prime Minister, it's been 10 years now since Georgia's war with Russia. Um, tell us a bit about what relations with Moscow uh, are like today and how you balance those with Georgia's um, very long-stated desire for deeper integration with the West. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have a legacy of 2008 and we still have to address the issues uh, inherited by Georgia, not only from 2008, but from the beginning of 90s. Occupation of two of our historic territories is a big problem. And of course, um, we have to deal with this issue with a constructive approach, but also with a principled approach, which means that taking into account the consistent policy of Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic integration and uh, the policy which is based on certain values, we still need to look for zones or areas with Russia which can serve as a base point in the future to start positive discussions about the um, political resolution of the conflict. And can you give us some examples of what those share? Those areas are? can be the trade, tourism, and of course, um, humanitarian and cultural relations. Um, today, we have the Russian market uh, is open for Georgia, although it's not the only market for Georgia or dominant market Georgia, as our exports have been diversified. Uh, but still, it's uh, very positive that we have around one million visitors from Russia every year. We have unilaterally visa-free regime for Russian citizens, and there is no a single conflict on the ethnical basis with Russian tourists. So which can be a very good starting point for starting uh, political discussions about the resolution of the conflict. But on the other side, Russia should take also into account that they should not look for a Georgian government which will get used to the so-called reality, as they like to say, of the new, newly independent states on our own territory. So our discussions should be based on the respect of the territorial integrity, which should be a cornerstone for every discussion in our region, and also uh, based on the sovereign aspirations of Georgia. You asked what is Georgia's policy uh, to um, address the challenges in our region, and I can, uh, I can answer, as President Aliyev said, of course, uh, neighborly relations with our neighbors is very important. We have important regional projects with Azerbaijan, with Turkey, with Kazakhstan, uh, with other countries in the region. We have strategic relations with Azerbaijan and Turkey. We have very good uh, uh, neighborly traditional relations with Armenia, and we have very important relations with uh, Central Asian countries. And we have a uh, Vice Prime Minister of Kazakhstan and all the Silk Road and all the new projects um, bringing new dynamics in our region. Of course, it cannot be without very close cooperation in the region, which can be a very good prerequisite for a sustainable peace. What is stability for Georgia? Stability for Georgia is positioning a country where we are. It's about values. And for Georgia, we set 
European integration and Euro-Atlantic integration as the strategic priority and step by step we are transforming our country into a truly European democracy and country which is uh, unique in terms of openness. It's trade, uh, it's free trade regimes with European Union and with China simultaneously with all the neighbor countries including with Russia and of course it's uh, internal structural reforms, deep structural reforms which make Georgia a truly democratic state. This is our Article 5. We don't have NATO protection, but partnership with the West and good neighborly relations and finding constant uh, uh, search for zones of common interests is the formula for stability in our region. Now, we all know, of course, what happened to Ukraine when its uh, negotiations with Europe uh, proceeded a little more quickly than the Russians would have liked. I'm, I'm sure that's at the front of your mind now as you conduct um, talks with Brussels and, and, and your European partners. How do you manage that threat? Well, um, there are threats all over, but uh, with European Union, uh, we have a very good dynamics in terms of bringing our country standards, democracy standards, closer to European standards. Ukraine, unfortunately, has been challenged by Russia, and uh, their territorial integrity, integrity is violated. We are very supportive to Ukraine's territorial integrity. And again, uh, as I said, territorial integrity should be a cornerstone of discussions in uh, regional conflicts. This is a principle that should not be questioned. Otherwise, we will come up with a, uh, we will end up with a mess, not only regionally, but also uh, globally, I think. But while that's a fine aspiration, it was precisely because Ukraine was on the verge of signing a, an association deal with, with uh, Europe that uh, the Russians decided to move in. Um, so as you try to move closer to the West, are there things that you can do to prevent the Russians from getting too, uh, too anxious? You know, it's, uh, this is uh, about uh, daily uh, issues in Georgia, how we face threats from Russia. And the same is in Ukraine, although um, it may look different, but the formula is the same. I would like to say that we are trying to show to our northern neighbor, Russia, that the policy of Georgia to become part of the Western community is not against anybody. It's not against our neighbors, including it's not against our Russia. Russia should be genuinely interested to have a stable southern neighbor. And of course, uh, we need to look for uh, platforms which can be positive, where we can find common interests, where we can start positive discussions about political resolution of the problems we have inherited. Have the Russians ever articulated what their red lines are? Well, they, uh, we, see, we hear from time to time statements about Georgia's NATO aspirations. But this is a so sovereign decision of Georgian people. And again, it is not against anybody in our region. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, um, Kazakhstan is extremely good at maintaining close ties with Russia, but not just with Russia. Um, uh, and as some of our other panelists will attest to, Moscow is not always the easiest of partners to do business with. In fact, it can be very challenging. Um, and yet, um, you do such a good job of keeping Russia happy while also working with China, while also working with the West. How optimistic are you that you can maintain this balancing act? Uh, uh, as mentioned before here, uh, Kazakhstan has two of the biggest neighbors. From one side, we have the longest border in the world of the Russia, and we have this um, second one, elephant, as you mentioned before, it's uh, China. And um, all this, uh, our uh, independent history, lasted over the 25 years. Uh, our president, uh, Ustan Nazarbayev, is providing external and internal policy, which brought us the main value, stability. As you know, we have very good relations with Russia, and uh, over the two decades before, my president has initiated this uh, to establishing the economic union, and already we have. We have no more custom barriers. We have this free floating of the working force for capital and everything. And exactly, uh, we are looking to Russian market, much more biggest than ours. 
as you know, the population of Kazakhstan is just 80 million people. And so we're looking around this, our, to our neighbor's markets. It's, I'm talking about Central Asia. I'm talking about Russia. It's the western part of the China. And um, I guess the uh, Eurasian Economic Union are in the beginning. But we see some benefits from there. Same time, we have very uh, intensive negotiation with our economic partners. And I hope uh, we are doing well. And uh, if you're asking me about the perspectives for our cooperation, uh, it's looking good. Because uh, uh, statistics are showing us how we're growing up, how the trade volume of our partners there. If you look at to our statistics, the main our partner, European Union, Second one, it says uh, Russia and China in third place. Uh, but this way, uh, if we'll discuss about this, uh, our relation of China, Kazakhstan is the first uh, upfront staying country on the new Silk Way. And as you know, the, uh, the new initiative and mega project which are providing in life and implementing uh, One Belt, One Road initiative, BRI initiative, began in Astana. Sometimes before, because uh, uh, President Xi Jinping is, uh, has announced in Astana on his in time is his visit, and already we have signed uh, the main the MIU principles for the new project in Kazakhstan, which are covering more than 40 projects, investment new projects, for the amount of about 26 billion dollars. It's something like the, it's the best benefit which we can get from such cooperation, and I think uh, uh, as uh, we discussed before and mentioned by Prime Minister Kvirikolishvili, is transport speed and transport corridor, which we have right now, beginning from the coast of Eastern China, which are going from China, Kazakhstan, Caspian Sea, and from Azerbaijan and Georgia. We have right now access to the European markets. And the new, world, uh, new railroad, which was opened last year from this uh, Baku Tbilisi cars to Tokyo, right now we have access to the Mediterranean Sea. And by this way, I guess uh, the total policy, which are providing more than two decades uh, by President Nazarbayev, once again brought this really this the best value, which you have uh, the such country in Kazakhstan. You know, we are the biggest landlocked country in the world. The nearest port for us is 3,300 kilometers around. And we are trying to use exactly all the opportunities, and we'll see the all challenges which we see before us. I wonder if uh, China's growing role and interest in Kazakhstan it makes your uh, relationships with, easier, uh, with Russia easier in the following way, that it's showing Moscow that it can no longer pretend that it's the only great power, that it, uh, it, whether it likes it or not, it doesn't own Central Asia anymore. Um, it may like to think of it as it's near abroad, but now there are other big players who are also very interested as well. And in a sense, it needs to compete with your affections rather than for your affections rather than simply assert its dominance. You know, uh, we can consent that uh, Kazakhstan became a really independent uh, state. And we're providing our sovereign policy with our neighbors and not just about the neighbors. And um, from this view, exactly uh, we're feeling uh, some pressure from side because it's, uh, if this, your neighbor's uh, size economy is 10 times bigger than yours, exactly you have some uh, negative uh, incomes which are coming time to time. But it's, I guess, uh, by way of the negotiation intensively. And so we are using all these uh, measures which you can use. We are the members of WTO, for example or inside of the Eurasian Economic Union, we can use this, all the instruments for that to negotiate and to solve such problems. And I hope we'll do that in later. Janiv, um, help us now um, pivot to uh, economics. Uh, as the leader of this huge international telecom, what do you see as the Eurasian region's um, greatest challenge as it seeks to develop um, and fully join the global economy? I think let me first maybe talk about the prospects uh, because we continue to be as sure. an investor and as an industrial investor encouraged by the prospects in the region. Uh, we serve over 50 million consumers every day in this part of the world. Uh, we see more opportunities to connect these consumers to the internet, more opportunities to uh, help them embark on a digital lifestyle uh, and also uh, access new services such as um, uh, banking services and mobile financial services. So overall, we're encouraged about the prospects in the region. 
Uh, I think we're also encouraged with the reforms that we've seen in the region. Uh, we've talked about Georgia, the openness of the reforms uh, in Georgia where we operate, the stability that we've seen in Kazakhstan has been uh, an important uh, element in terms of our prospects uh, there. But recently, the liberalization in Uzbekistan is also where we operate, an important uh, factor uh, for an international investor. And we haven't yet debated about the policies that most of the Eurasian countries are introducing in terms of digital economies, which are very important uh, for the future of the telecoms uh, industry. Uh, so I think there are quite a number of areas where we're quite encouraged about what we see in the last uh, few years. I think what's important for an industrial player for, as ourselves is to translate uh, these reforms, uh, these visions, uh, into regulations, day-to-day -day regulations that offers uh, in telecom stability so we know exactly where we're going. We invest several hundreds of millions of dollars every year in this part of the world. Uh, the return on investment is not in six or 12 months' time. We're investing five, 10 years out ultimately. So having not only modern uh, regulation, but stable uh, regulation is absolutely critical uh, for our sector uh, as it's highly regulated overall. And can you help in the, the actual development of those policies? Absolutely, and we work with each of the governments uh, in question uh, working on these uh, policies. I think that's a very important part. We're generally the number one or number two telecommunication operator in these uh, countries. So I think that's first uh, dimension, um, regulations, stable, uh, modern, benchmarkable uh, as absolutely uh, critical. It's also translating some of the digital uh, visions into practical realities also from a uh, regulatory point of view. Uh, in several countries, we're still behind in terms of specific policies to introduce new mobile financial services, for example. Um, so we need to see the connection and the speed of connection between, uh, on one hand, um, new visions and policies and the regulations uh, on the ground. Fiscal matters are also uh, very important for us and the predictability of fiscal uh, policies. Um, the telecom industry is generally one of the top three contributors uh, in terms of income tax. Uh, and we need to see stability uh, in the fiscal policies that are really linked to long-term investments because uh, if our networks are gonna come to rural parts of Eurasia, if we're gonna co connect more of the population to the internet, it's absolutely crucial uh, that we have fiscal reforms that allow for long-term investments to be viable uh, for international investors. And the last point that I'd make also that's absolutely critical for us are the reforms from an education point of view, uh, particularly as we focus on new digital uh, platforms, new digital services. It's critical for us to see that the talent pool uh, is uh, available uh, in areas such as software development and um, data scientists, and each of the governments in questions is really focusing on that. Um, but that you know, remains for me a few of the key challenges uh, that still need to be better addressed potentially uh, for more foreign investment uh, and uh, for the prospects of uh, renewed growth. Mr. President, uh, tell us a bit about um, uh, Azerbaijan's attempt to diversify its economy away from oil and gas and whether now that prices are going back up again, that will threaten the attempt to, to move away. And diversification of economy is our main objective and I think that we achieved uh, good success in that direction. Uh, when uh, we uh, experienced a dramatic drop of oil prices, I said in Azerbaijan that uh, for us it's already post-oil period have started. And we should forget about oil, forget about gas. Of course, we must uh, implement completely the projects which we are now uh, implementing. But as far as a, a source of major income, we should look at technology, innovation, industry, entrepreneurship, and um, agriculture. Therefore, we introduced uh, very serious reforms, which already brought good results. And the uh, non-oil sector of our economy grew uh, almost 3% last year, and non-oil industry almost 4%. Uh, therefore, I should say that the process of diversification is already here, and we have no plans to slow down. Now the price of oil goes up, 
but uh, it will just um, increase our reserves. We managed to <coughs> optimize our expenses. And uh, last year, still the price was low, but we earned $4.5 billion more to our reserves. That means that uh, even with uh, low price, we will be on the safe side. Our budget of this year is based on $45 per barrel. Therefore, whatever is more than that will go again to the sovereign fund. But at the same time, we should all understand that oil and gas will continue to be the main part of our economy. Though already today, uh, non-oil sector is about 70% of our GDP. So our target is to diversify our export, uh, to increase the level of non-oil products in our export portfolio. As far as energy projects are concerned, once again, they are important for us, they're important for the region. And the projects which we initiated actually is change the energy map of the region. Uh, the first pipeline we built to Georgian port of Supsa connected Caspian and Black Sea. And then the second pipeline uh, for crude oil from Baku, Tbilisi, Jehan, connecting Caspian and Mediterranean. Then on the same route, we built a gas pipeline. Therefore, we already have a diversified uh, export routes for our hydrocarbons. At the same time, providing substantially energy security of our partners, including uh, those in Europe. Some countries of uh, European Union get biggest part of their oil supply from Azerbaijan. And after we successfully complete the Southern Gas Corridor project, in uh, two, three years' time, they will also get access to our natural gas. Uh, the same I can say about our transportation project, which Mr. Vice Prime Minister referred to, Bakut Bilisi cars change the transportation map of the region. It is now the shortest route from China to Europe, which will take you about two weeks instead of 30, 35 days before that. So this is a new map of transportation, the new map of energy diversification, and um, Azerbaijan, being a landlocked country, managed, I think, already to transform, uh, we still have to work, but already into a regional transportation hub. So future will be not in oil and gas. Oil and gas will come to an end one day. Future is innovation, efficiency, good governance, management, transparency, and state support to entrepreneurship. And do you feel that the, uh, the public is already ready to take advantage of these opportunities, whether it's um, through education or, or other measures? Definitely, because uh, one of our main objectives uh, several years ago was to reduce poverty and unemployment. And that was done successfully. Level of poverty in Azerbaijan is 5.4%. <laughs> and level of unemployment is 5%. In the last um, 15 years, our population grew 1.5 million people. Therefore, creating jobs for us is a permanent process. Last year, we created 177 permanent jobs. And um, this uh, demonstrates our uh, policy. Also, oil and gas, they do not create many jobs. In order to have unemployment low, we need always to look at education, uh, management, agriculture, tourism, services. Therefore, population is ready for reforms, and our reforms were very positively received by the uh, people. Uh, they were not painful, because when you do radical reforms in the first stage, it is painful for population. So we introduced a very substantial social package to those who still need that state support. Therefore, this was a smooth process. And basically, in the coming years, we need only to continue what we have started two years. I mean, the very deep and comprehensive economic reforms policy. Prime Minister, obviously no country will succeed in developing um, unless it gets corruption under control. Um, Georgia has become a star in the region for its efforts in recent years. Tell us briefly, what were the keys to your success? And then if you will, what are the lessons uh, you think that Georgia can teach other countries still struggling with uh, deep-seated corruption? Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, corruption cannot be viewed as a standalone challenge among many other challenges. This is about the full complex of reforms 
uh, undertaken by Georgian government. This is about openness of economy. This is eliminating trade barriers, no, not only tariff barriers, also non-tariff barriers. This is a constant improvement of border crossing procedures and also deep reforms inside the country. We, uh, Georgia has become a chair of country of the Open Governance Partnership. Uh, last year we received it from France. Uh, we undertake deep reforms. Uh, I was listening uh, to Mr. Charlie and as uh, it was mentioned, it's like an agenda of Georgian government. You said predictability, for example. I can echo uh, every item you mentioned. We created the Investor Council where we have all major representatives of business community, business association leaders, IFI representatives, and several ministers. We meet once in a quarter to discuss all the upcoming changes to regulations and legislation so that there are no negative surprises for business community. Everything is transparent. Digital economy. We are creating a um, unified front office project, which is called Business House Project. It's digital and physical, both. We are detaching existing front offices from government agencies, merging them in one unit and placing them in, in one place physically in the capital of Georgia and also regionally in regional centers. In parallel with that, we are creating digital unified front office where we will render all the services not only for individuals, which we already have in Georgia, but also for legal entities. It means further improvement of transparency. It means further decreasing any chances for corruption as all the services will be located physically and digitally in one space. So fiscal policy. During 2017, Georgian economy grew by 5%, 4.9%. It's preliminary data. Our tourism grew by 28%. Our exports grew by 29% and our current account deficit decreased from 12 to 7%. Our budget deficit decreased from 4.9 to 3%. So all the data, are, there is very prudent macroeconomic environment. And uh, of course it is reflected in international rankings. Let me give you several examples. During the last five years, according to World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Index. Macroeconomic environment improved by 89 positions from 137th position to 48th position. In extent of market dominance, our rankings, uh, according to World Economic Forum, improved by 45 positions during the last five years from 112th to 67th position. And we are one of the leading uh, countries in the region. Why it happened? Because we demonopolized several important industries. In the property rights category, very key for business environment. We had 120th position just five years ago, 2012. 74 position improvement. We are 46th right now, according to World Economic Forum ranking. We are number nine, uh, according to World Bank in doing business and in corruption, anti-corruption uh, efforts, according to uh, in, uh, Transparency International, Heritage Foundation, all major international institutions, constant improvement from 10 to 15 percentile every year in Georgia. So why it happens? This is about political will, dedication of the whole team, and of course this is not the end of the road. We consider this dynamism not only consistency, but also pace of the reforms as the key for the success of the country. And international projects, geographic location is, uh, of course, the basic and at the same time added value to everything fundamental what we do in our country. Baku Tbilisi Gars railway project, it changed the transport map of the, of the, uh, of the country. New deep sea port construction, Anaglia port on the Black Sea shore engagement of Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan, uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, and Europe, starting from China, it took nine days for a direct train from China to Georgia, and this is a 
big achievement, not only for, of one country, but of all the countries engaged. So let's return to corruption specifically for a moment. It's obvious, as we said, that no country can become rich uh, unless it tackles corruption. Um, but I wonder if it works the other way around as well, which is that no country can effectively tackle corruption while it remains very poor. Is that a challenge for Georgia as well? Well, this is a challenge, of course. Uh, today, uh, uh, the, 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 the level of democracy in Georgia can be challenged by the, um, uh, the social uh, wellness, uh, actually well-being level in, in Georgia. This is a big challenge, of course, and this is a, uh, economic uh, uh, development and uh, tackling the poverty issue generally in the country is the biggest challenge for the development of the country. This is why, uh, for us, the biggest priority is to come up with special uh, state projects aimed at decreasing poverty, uh, eliminating poverty, and this is why we are specially focused on the startup entrepreneurs, on the special economic projects in rural areas. This is micro grants projects. This is a project produced in Georgia, supporting startup enterprises, especially in rural areas, in several ways. In the startup period, we are subsidizing bank loans, but only for startup period, not to distort the uh, competitive environment. This is about sharing collateral obligations in commercial banks for startup companies. This is about financing, bringing of foreign experts in the areas which is new for Georgia. It's hydroponics, it's uh, uh, manuf different manufacturing directions. So this is a complex of steps undertaken by the government in order to um, uh, mitigate risks coming from the general poverty in the country. So I don't want to, yes. I just wanted to intervene and uh, we're, we're very encouraged as an industrial player in Georgia by the reforms and the quality of the reforms that uh, the prime minister and his government have undertaken in the past few years. And we see clearly today uh, the ease of doing business for an international investor are clearly there in Georgia. Uh, we see that the region, in fact, is reforming itself more and more on these matters. And I think the point on corruption is absolutely uh, a critical point, uh, that there be zero tolerance. That's certainly our policy. Uh, and we've seen the progress made on these matters also in, uh, uh, in, in Georgia. So I can only echo what's uh, uh, been said by the uh, prime minister. And just to return to the last part of my question, First question on, on corruption. Um, are there ways in which Georgia can or is already helping its neighbors, uh, using its expertise to, to teach lessons to those that are, have made less progress on corruption? Well, let me not say helping, but we have a very good cooperation with our neighbor countries. Under the Open Governance Partnership platform, we have an excellent cooperation with all our neighbor countries. So it's sharing experience, and it, this cannot be a one-way one uh, initiative. It's always uh, mutual benefits that we we'll look for, and uh, we should not look at other countries that you know we are different. This is we are saying the same region. Uh, there are areas where we perform maybe better. There are areas where we may lay behind. So this is not something that we can uh, become teachers for everyone. Uh, that was a very modest answer. I was giving you a chance to brag if you want to. <laughs> I understand. Uh, uh, and also, let me echo the education point. You know. Several years that I served in the government, being an economic minister, also uh, the, the, as a prime minister, I have been meeting entrepreneurs who had problems when they import new technology, when they start a new project. There's always been a problem to find qualified workforce. So I, I have been hearing these complaints. I have a problem of finding a, a feeding specialist for new cows imported from Netherlands or Germany. I have a problem of uh, uh, the software specialists uh, when we have a new software player, uh, uh, IT company coming to Georgia. We came up with an initiative of co-financing professional education together with private companies. And this has become number one priority for our country. And generally changing the very unhealthy proportion between higher education and professional education, and to make professional education more prestigious in the country, this is the primary goal for us. We took Germany as an excellent example of dual education model. Uh, this model exists in Switzerland, in Austria, so we are drawing this experience and building a very successful 
professional education model in the country, co-financing it and the uh, public-private partnership schemes together with private company, responding to immediate needs of the private sector and at the same time directly giving a channel to young generation and not, not only young generation, to everyone for immediate employment after the professional education. I'd love to take some questions now from the audience if there are any. There have to be some. I can't believe that we've already covered everything to do with the region. No, well, as you're thinking about your questions, which I know will come up, oh, do I have one behind me? Please. Um, if you just tell us who you are as well. Oh, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Ron Vitter. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Ron Mitter. I'm director of the China Center at Oxford University, which informs my question. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more from any members of the panel about the way in which China's changing role and also organizations such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization are affecting the connections between security, economics, trade, and also perhaps less tangible, more cultural links between different parts of the Eurasia region. Do you want to start? Uh, uh. Uh, Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, as you know, um, extended and, uh, two new members joined last year, as you know, uh, Pakistan and India. And uh, historically, it's brought maybe more stability in the whole region. I'm not talking about, about Central Asia only. We're talking about all the covering the, all the Eurasian region plus maybe South Asia. And I think it's um, all such measures or maybe such um, international institutions in new form can bring us uh, maybe this, really this, not just about the political or maybe economical value. I'm talking about this, uh, we're feeling better, you know, we should uh, be much more closer to each other. If you're talking not just about the BRI initiative, for example, but it's, uh, Kazakhstan is looking for, for example, the new markets. And uh, for us, any new economic partners, which we can get inside of such organizations, will be very useful for uh, Kazakhstan economy, first of all. And same is will be useful for whole the Central Asia, because we are not trying to keep everything only for Kazakhstan. Because if you look at to Uzbekistan and to Kazakhstan, total population will be around the 50 million people. It's a huge market for the future. But today, it's, uh, Uzbekistan is just opening. But we hope in next maybe the five years, we'll have the good chance to cooperate much more deeply and um, we will use this such opportunity for our future development and movement. And by this way, I guess uh, I fully support, once again, any cooperation in our region because uh, the situation is, uh, Afghanistan is not so far from us. Sometimes the people is trying to say, uh, where are from, from Kazakhstan, it's the same as Pakistan and Afghanistan. Yes, we don't have this one border of them, but we have this great influence and uh, Kazakhstan is a very active participant for different types of uh, sponsoring programs. Uh, we're right now on the way of establishing Kazate. It's a special organization who will support such countries like this, Afghanistan. And so we have already a special program for bilateral uh, cooperation between us, but we are invite all the countries who can be part of this process. And maybe Shanghai, the cooperation organization, can be very supportive for such idea. And what about the cultural element of the question? Are there links there that can be built on between Kazakhstan and China? Yes, because it's uh, one of the main target of this initiative, uh, I guess it's a more this, uh, be closer on the cultural level. Because uh, if you look at this historical, this ancient Silk Way, they brought something, many things to Europe, mm -hmm. beginning from paper, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess it's uh, maybe this new Silk Way you know, will bring it maybe some new level of under, uh, equal understanding of what's happening in China and in other countries, same in Central Asia. Because, for example, Kazakhstan is looking more as a bridge between the, our one-third is located in, in Europe and two-third is located in Asia. And we are really a Eurasian country. Thank you. Are there more questions? Well, I have another. Um, jean uh, tell us about how um, uh, the countries in the region um, can use new technologies to leapfrog ahead. You've mentioned it already in your opening remarks, but I'm, um, I, I'd like to hear more and be as specific as you can. Well, I think that uh, one of the prospects of the region is, in fact, uh, 
uh, a population that's growing, a population that is accessing more and more of the internet, and hence it's just at the beginning uh, of digital lifestyles. And I think that uh, Georgia, um, going back to Georgia, is a prime example of using, at the government level, uh, the digital economy to really open up uh, services for the population, for investors such as ourselves. Uh, and so I think that these new technologies can not only uh, you know, bring advantages to the government level, but obviously uh, to the uh, economic growth. In certain parts of the region, there are excellent software development capabilities. Uh, we uh, develop uh, software, for example, in areas such as uh, Ukraine. Uh, we use Kazakhstan as a hub to provide services to other parts of the region. Uh, so we think that the, these new technologies and the digital economy can really uh, help uh, the whole of the region uh, leapfrog in certain areas, uh, making the unbanked banked more quickly, uh, bringing uh, you know, the internet to rural areas. All these are a host of opportunities uh, that uh, the internet uh, and digital uh, technologies bring to the region. Um, yes, please. Hello, my name is Andrew Wilson. I'm the managing director of the Center for International Private Enterprise. And my question is for, uh, well, we heard from our Georgian uh, prime minister here about all the, the, the policy elements and things that Georgia is doing to help promote private sector development, in particular small business development in the region. And I would like to hear from the other leaders from the region to, to get a sense of what they think the role of small business is in diversification of their economies and what they're doing to promote that. We in Azerbaijan have a special fund to support entrepreneurship. And through that fund, um, during the last decade or more, um, almost $2 billion have been uh, delivered to private sector on a very preferential basis. Uh, low interest loans with the recommendations, uh, with the state support to private sector. Especially, uh, we pay attention to regional development. We implement now the third regional development program, which allowed us to create conditions for small uh, enterprises to do business. What the conditions were. First, infrastructure. We built in 15 years more than 12,000 kilometers of roads, including village roads, which uh, allow not only easy access, to services, but also which allow farmers to bring the products to the market. Uh, the level of gasification in Azerbaijan is 93%. Taking into account the mountainous region, I think it's very high. We uh, transform from importer to exporter of electric energy. Therefore, we have extra capacity and extra source. Um, also, uh, every year, uh, around 100,000 hectares of land are irrigated by the state. Above from that, uh, our farmers do not pay any taxes except land tax and uh, pay only 30% of fertilizers and 50% of fuel. So this is a state support to business and uh, this is a substantial support. Also the subsidies to farmers and uh, very good investment climate in Azerbaijan. We attracted 230 billion US dollars of investments, half foreign, half local, in the last 15 years. So all that created uh, conditions for private sector to, to develop. At the same time, uh, referring to the beginning of conversation, very good relations with the neighbors allow us to have easy access to the neighboring markets and uh, which is our main uh, market for our non-oil production. Therefore, the policy of uh, support to the private sector will continue. Uh, the level of uh, small enterprises in our GDP is still very low. Therefore, our main target for the coming years will be to create additional conditions for them in order to uh, generate jobs and generate more profit. Jean-Marie? Yeah, you know. uh, there's an ongoing global competition in creating norms, uh, and the European Union is one of the 
norm generating um, organization in the world. Um, Georgia clearly has made the choice of getting as close as possible to uh, the norms of the EU. I think it would be interesting to see uh, from the region how influential they see uh, European norms, what the Europeans could do better to uh, uh, have their norms uh, become uh, more dominant in the region. And, do you want uh, to be any more specific when you're referring to norms? <laughs> well, there are norms in, uh, for instance, in telecoms, there are norms, there are, I mean, there are a number of norms that govern more and more the trade and services uh, that are critical to the development of trade. And you, you see uh, the norms, the US generated norm, the European generated norms. Uh, there is a convergence, but there are also differences. And so it'd be interesting to, to see how the various countries see that issue and also the perspective of business on that. Who wants to start? Well, just very briefly, I will say that uh, in the medium or maybe a little bit longer prospect, Georgia sees himself as a full member of European Union. So we uh, decided for ourselves to embrace all the regulations and norms of the European Union. But we have a gradual approximation agenda and action plan which envisages uh, implementation, implementation of European norms according to a schedule we have. Now we came up with even a rigorous, more rigorous agenda to go beyond the schedule and be ahead of the schedule for 2020 in terms of implementing European norms. So far, we have only observed uh, positive dynamics accompanied by implementing European norms as it opens uh, new opportunities for us, for exports uh, to European market not only goods, but also services. So according to our association agreement, deep and comprehensive free trade area agreement, we are able to sell our products and services uh, tariff-free to European market. Why is it so important? Because it cannot be important if we consider it as a standalone free trade agreement. In addition to that, we have free trade agreements with EFTA countries, with Switzerland and other EFTA countries. We have free trade agreement with all the neighboring countries and with China. I remember when we started negotiations with China of free trade agreement, degree of skepticism and fear inside the country among the local business uh, representatives, that it may ruin the prospects of industrial development in Georgia. It did not happen. We have a quite opposite trend in Georgia. Chinese companies are eager to consider Georgia as a base or platform for manufacturing, at least partial manufacturing of goods to, to sell the goods to European market and vice versa. We had a number of meetings today with Indian companies. Indian companies are interested to open branches in Georgia for business outsourcing, which means that there are more prospects from opening up for international trade than drawbacks. This is what Georgia's experience shows, and this is an absolutely empirical evidence of the benefits of free trade based on the example of Georgia. Thank you. President Aliyev, let's talk about uh, another type of uh, European norm which has to do with uh, political participation and human rights. Um, it's argued uh, by many that um, these are uh, critical not only to, um, uh, to uh, the individual human experience, but also to economic uh, development, and that you can't have one without the other. Um, how is that playing out in Azerbaijan, which has been criticized um, on issues like press freedoms? Yeah, I think that this criticism has no grounds because if you look to the substance, all the basic freedoms in Azerbaijan are provided, including freedom of press, which is absolutely free. And uh, about 80% of the population of Azerbaijan are internet users. And uh, when internet is free without any censorship, and absolute majority of population are using internet, it's difficult to talk about restriction of 
of press. But then how then, explain for me so I can understand, why does Azerbaijan get a, a, a ranking of 162 from the World Press Freedom in, in Index? Uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, based on uh, political grounds. It has nothing to do with reality. Again, all the fundamental freedoms are provided. And uh, our government is implementing a very important project of bringing broadband internet to every village. Therefore, uh, this um, classification is based on a very biased approach, sometimes very hostile approach. It is generated uh, in some political centers in the West. Can and you be more specific? Where does this hostility Well, I would not prefer to talk more uh, precise about that. I think it's clear where it comes from, why it comes, why. And the reason is very simple, because Azerbaijan is a country which is implementing uh, independent policy, policy based on our national interests. We do not join any adventure which is risky and which can create complications for our country. As I said before, we do not have internal risks. We have a stable political and economic situation. All the potential risks which we may face may come from outside. Uh, there have been uh, a lot of attempts to drag Azerbaijan into kind of campaign against some countries. We were always very neutral. We do not play against anyone, and we are not part of any campaign which is risky and which is not in line with our national interests. Therefore, main reason for attacks is that uh, some may consider Azerbaijan to be too independent for not a very big country. And these kind of ratings of uh, some NGOs are aimed to discredit our reputation, to damage our reputation, to present Azerbaijan as non-democratic uh, country, which is not true. And uh, again, we are talking today about political development and economic development. You cannot separate one from another. And in the country, which according to uh, World Economic Forum, uh, economist competitiveness is number 35th, I think it's a good indicator that uh, the country is free. Uh, Davos uh, also issued recently a rating of the public trust in politicians, and Azerbaijan he is number 20. And the inclusive development uh, index among developing countries, Azerbaijan is number three. If all these uh, ratings which uh, some NGOs are trying to, you know, introduce were true, we wouldn't have achieved that success. Therefore, uh, we need, need to look to the substance, to the real situation, and uh, separate uh, political agenda or some expectations towards Azerbaijan from uh, the reality. So the World Economic Forum tells its moderators at the end we're supposed to summarize everything that's been discussed. Um, there's absolutely no way that I could do that because our panelists have done such a good job themselves. So just please join me in thanking them and thanks to all of you.